Welcome to Business Mathematics, this time with a unit on subperiod compounding. Well, what we're going to talk here is relatively simple because up to this point we always assumed that in each period there's only one interest payment. In this unit we're going to talk about how to proceed if this no longer holds. So what do I mean if this no longer holds? Well, we can illustrate this with an example. Here we have an amount of 5,000 euros, which is deposited in an account with a yearly interest rate of 6%. Whereas, and that's now the new thing, interest payments are due every three months. So we basically get interest on a quarterly basis. And then question, calculate the deposits worth after eight years. And how does the result change if payments are due every month? So that's like a second part. But first off, the difference here is in each period, so each year, we actually have four interest payments. So due to the compounding effect, in the end, we will have a higher result as if we were to only have one interest payment, even though we reduce the 6% accordingly. How do we reduce the 6% which we have as a yearly interest rate? Well, if we have this on a quarterly basis, we simply divide this by four because in each period, each year, we have four quarters. If on the other hand, in the second part, we're going to work on a monthly basis, we have six months in a year, in a period, so we will divide the interest rate by 12. Well, however, due to the fact that not only the interest rate decreases, but the number of interest periods increases. So if we work here for eight years and we work on a quarterly basis, we actually have to multiply the eight years with the four quarters because we have in total 40 interest payments. So if we write this down in a formula, looks as follows. So what we do is actually make only two changes to our formula. We divide the interest rate by the number of subperiods and we multiply the number of periods with the number of subperiods. That's everything there is. So we only have to adjust the t accordingly. And well, we can also directly see if we work on a yearly basis, as we did up to this point, we will get the original formula again. Okay, so using this formula, getting back to our example, the quarterly case with a K0 of 5,000, yearly interest rate of 6%, a T of 4, because it's quarterly, and an N of 8, because it's 8 years. So we just insert these values. And then we get a new interest factor of 1.015, and this to the power of 32, giving us, in the end, a value of 8051.62. That was on a quarterly basis. So now if we work instead on a monthly basis, well, we just replace the 4 we used for the T before with a 12 because now we have 12 months. So then this looks as follows. So the only thing which changed is instead of the 4 at those two points, so I can show you in detail, instead of the four here and the four here, so the two parts where the T is, we now have 12. More interest payments because now interest is paid on a monthly basis. So what changes? Well, first off, the interest factor decreases. It's only 1.005, but the number of interest periods that's increasing, so that's 96. Well, if we calculate the result, we get as a result 8070.71. So we saw our final result increases.
And that's always the case. If we increase the number of subperiod or number of subperiods, if we increase the t, our end result will always increase. However, we won't get an infinite amount if we just make the subperiods small enough. Because while they are still increasing, they are also getting closer and closer and closer to a specific value. So there's actually a limit to which value we can actually achieve by getting as small our subperiods as possible. So in other words, decreasing the number of um, or the time it takes until the next interest payment, increasing thus the number of subperiods, will increase the capital output in the end. If you work in a fashion like this, there are alternatives to work with subperiod compounding. We're not going to talk about them at this point. In this way, actually, this works out fine. You will be better off with more subperiod. There's an alternative where you will actually get exactly the same thing as in the case you would have gotten if this were actually no subperiod compounding. As I said, we are not going into more details about this at the moment. So, well, that's then already everything there is for this type of subperiod compounding. So, I hope you enjoyed listening to it. And well, See you next time. So goodbye.